no, no, hey, 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 go away. Hey, 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 go away. I am honored to uh, introduce someone at this time uh, who I have a great deal of respect for. Um, this is Liz Elgin DeRowan, and some of you may know her. Um, she does a tremendous amount of good work for Indian Country. Uh, Liz is an ICWA court advocate employed with the Indian Child and Family Preservation Program. She's been doing this work for ICFPP since 1994. She holds a degree in Administration of Juvenile Justice, Corrections, and Juvenile Probation. She also holds a degree in Court Reporting and a Paralegal Certificate. Liz also served as Tribal Chairperson and Vice Chairperson for her father's tribe, the Dry Creek Rancheria Band of Pomo Indians. Liz has testified on numerous enactments related to the Indian Child Welfare Act uh, in California and also with NCAI. Liz has provided training on code and tribal court development with the National Indian Justice Center. She serves as an expert witness in ICWA hearings for numerous tribes and counties. She is an ICWA consultant and curriculum developer with the California Administrative Office of the Courts and the, the Judicial Council of California, meaning she trains the judges in ICWA. In 2008, she was appointed and currently serves as a task force member on the California Office of Emergency Services Children's Justice Act Task Force, representing the Native American Children's Discipline. She also currently serves on an advisory board member with the Restorative Resources Juvenile Justice Project, serves as the current chairperson of the Board of Directors of Yakeyama Indian Education and Development Incorporated. She serves as an ICWA roundtable participant in Lake, Mendocino, and Sonoma counties, and is co-chair of the Tribal Caucus on ICWA um, and for the California Department of Social Services work group for the Northern Region. On a personal note, um, I have seen Liz go to the ends of the earth for Indian children. If she could move heaven and earth for the benefit of Indian child, she will do her best to make that happen. She never turns anyone away. She never says no, no matter how busy she is, if there's someone in need. In addition to all the things I've just mentioned, she's a tremendous community leader, and I am fortunate enough to call her the grandmother of my son, Talon. Um, <laughs> she, she has also brought with her her daughter, Layla Durowan, who has been an uh, ICWA advocate for at least 10 years now, and also she holds a degree in um, criminal justice, among others. So, without further ado, please give a warm welcome for Liz and Layla DeRowan. Good afternoon. Can you hear me okay? A little louder? I can probably scoot up a little bit like I'm singing, huh? <laughs> I'm happy that we have the, the podium here so you don't see me squirm around here for my papers or anything. But um, I'm really honored to be here, and I really appreciate the opportunity to be here uh, with you. And I say with you because this is uh, an endeavor, a journey together for all our tribal people. And I just think it's awesome that the tribes put this together. This is something that we've, we've needed for years. And so I, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here um, at this time. It's the very beginning of it. So I look forward to a lot of good work, a lot of good efforts throughout the, through the coming years. And uh, let's move this forward. Um, the, the presentation that we're going to do today, uh, we normally do a one to two day full day just on the law and practical part of it. We also do full day trainings on qualified expert witness and other stuff which take an enormous amount of additional training but what we're hoping to do is um, put our training together in the next three hours we're going to break it up in two parts and uh, break up those roles and responsibilities um, so just um, briefly we're going to do an overview and uh, 
So a little bit about uh, the Indian Child and Family Preservation Program. As you heard uh, Victorio um, announce, uh, I'm an employee of the Indian Child Family Preservation Program and we're a consortium of tri federally recognized tribes implementing the Indian Child Welfare Act. Uh, we're an all Indian nonprofit uh, corporation and we're chartered under uh, the Hoopa Tribes Corporation Code. It doesn't say that, but that's how we're chartered. Uh, we're fully federal and uh, we're not state exempt, we're tribal exempt. Uh, we, among we have um, two offices, one in Sonoma County, one in Mendocino County. Um, I've heard um, that we have case, cases in over 38 counties in California, and I'd say at least a handful of states currently. The two offices Layla mentioned, one, our main office is in uh, Ukiah, that's our main office with our director and staff up there, and then the satellite office that we, op that we operate out of is in Sonoma County, which is located in Santa Rosa. Among some of the Indian Child Welfare Services, um, and this is just to kind of bring you up to speed of what we do, and then we'll get into the, the, the law portion of it and how it applies. Um, here's just a few of the services uh, that we provide. Um, the advocation and research, those are two very important roles. A consultation with organization and other tribes. Uh, training in furtherance of the compliance portion of it. That's compliance on all ends, the courts, the system, CPS, attorneys, who you name it, compliance. It, it relates to every party, everybody. Uh, recruitment of Indian foster homes. Uh, offering uh, referrals for individual marriage and uh, family counseling, also conducting su supervised visitation, uh, and also providing cultural outreach and activities. The one thing that you don't see up there, uh, it also is serves as a qualified expert witness and trains on the qualified expert witness role. So we left that one off of there because we'd go off on a tangent on that one. <laughs> so that takes quite a bit of uh, additional time to train on that. Uh, where we get our vested authority to operate our program. Uh, the Indian Child's uh, Family Preservation's authority to create its program is further defined in Title II of the Indian Child Welfare Act. It is a solely tribally created program specific to the tribes who are part of our consortium. Um, so uh, up here what we've done is we've basically laid out the authority where the funding comes from and some of the tribal and tribal people in the room know that if you are in a 638 contract with the Bureau of Indian Affairs this is where a portion of our funding comes from so our program fully complies with those uh, parameters under the act and uh, we have additional services and program activities outside of the um, BIA rule. This was done by a local artist for one of our conferences, so we thought we'd throw that in there. Okay, so before we start, um, we just wanted to check in with the audience, see who's kind of here. We know there's a, a whole mesh of representatives here, so we've got tribal council members, quite a bit, well, tribal staff, and then there's also, who were we Students? missing? Students? What was it? Gaming. 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 Oh, okay. All right. Yay. No. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So, and then one other thing we're going to do um, before we um, get into the overview of the act, we're just going to see if there's any specific questions that people might have before we start so we can make sure to try to address those throughout our presentation. We did have two questions that were already posed to us. The first one was, how does disenrollment affect the ICWA? The second one, can a tribe intervene at any time? Are there any other questions before we start? If there were Indian child facilities, such as group homes or, or Indian-based foster homes, and what the needs were throughout the, throughout the areas that you um, oversee. Good question. Thank I'm, you. Um, would just like to see if you could outline the uh, requirements um, for a tribal compliance to ICWA. Uh, tribal compliance? Yeah, like um, I had been an ICWA director at one time and um, just had some issues with compliance on behalf of the tribe that I just wanted to know. So you know. on the tribal side of it, not so much as the law. Okay, yes. sure. I'd like to know what, uh, what the criteria is for a family 
that a child is placed into? Um, I'd like to know about maybe funding and um, the court, uh, tribal court systems, juris jurisdiction for ICWA cases, things like that. And also, um, Liz, if you could comment on the, the lawsuit that was just filed um, against the ICWA by the um, adoption Attorneys. group. Um, I, I just, sure, I, I don't have the case in front of me, but I do know just... Um, by anti-ICWA, is that what? Yeah, oh, anti was it the Goldwater it, group uh, or something like that? Uh, yeah, Goldwater. Um, there also is an organization uh, entitled Quad A, and that's what the tribal people are referring to them as. Uh, Quad A stands for AAAA, which is the Adoption Attorneys of America. Um, they've been around for decades. They are spearheading this lawsuit in addition to um, we think this is a, is a result of the aftermath of the Baby Veronica case because they didn't get what they wanted in that decision, they're going forward with the question of constitutionality. The other issue that they're looking at right now, and this is just briefly, um, is that um, they're combining their forces with county councils, also adoption assistant attorneys in all religious, not all, I can't say all, but a number of religious-based organizations. Um, they are strong, they are in force, they've come out in by the hundreds um, about we just, money. It, it, is, it is about money and we believe, and this is just a, tech, a term that I'm using, it, it really is um, Indian child trafficking. Um, if you don't get the, your way in one state, you take the child across state lines and you do it in another state. And this is what these attorneys are doing, these are what these organizations are doing, and they're doing it all in the name of the best interests of our Indian children. And they're saying that the Indian Child Welfare Act is unconstitutional, um, that it sets it out as a race-based law, and we happen to know that's not. We'll go through the details of that in the presentation, but that's essentially what they're attacking. They're saying that the Constitution shouldn't allow for Indian children to be treated differently than any other child, but we happen to know that's why the Indian Child Welfare Act was created. So, you know, we want to take this opportunity to let you know we, we do need to band together on this. There needs to be more information shared. You will, you will see some of the information shared from California Indian Legal Services has some on their website and they will be sending information out. Um, it's brand new. We just seen a post yesterday, I believe, on YouTube. There was a listening session on YouTube. So it's alive and well. They have a whole marketing and media campaign right now. So you're, you're going to see anti-ICWA, anti-ICWA, anti-ICWA. Um, and it's, that's what you do when you want to get something passed. We all know that. So that's what they're hitting home right now. So the lawsuit will go forward and um, we'll see what we can do to pull together and uh, get a project maybe up and running a task force in California to work with NARF and NCII, National Indian Child Welfare. Absolutely, I think once it gets to the lawsuit um, stage, um, whoever is going to take that up, and most of the time we see California Indian Legal Services stepping forward to file. Um, what we normally do is we ask for letters, friends of the court letters, and that could be circulated. And those are things that I think we need to start mobilizing better um, and really get on track on how to do that, how to mobilize very efficiently when something like this happens. No question. Mm. I was wondering if you could touch more on the supervised visits. Sure. Thank you. I think this is a good example of what Rob Porter talked about yesterday is that, you know, our sovereignty is always under attack and the fight never, truly never ends. It will always be ongoing. Go ahead. Keep going. So, yeah, she just um, mentioned we're going to do a quick, hopefully, a quick overview of the law and then provide some... Um, ICWA basics and resources, and then after the break, we're going to get into the practical applications of what that actually means in our everyday practice. So a little bit of history, and we happen to know that over the course of the last few days, um, a number of you have been, um, have seen a number of uh, national issues, circumstances. 
um, all leading to a profound negative history in, in, in the United States. Um, and California. In right. addition, <laughs> right. California has its own profound history, uh, atrocious history. Right, so um, we're not going to spend too much time on that because we're sure everybody's heard that, like she said, last couple days. Just some statistics for you on the pre-passage of the act itself. Go ahead. Uh, in California alone, um, California Indian children were eight times more likely to be removed from Indian families and homes than non-Indian children. Over 90% over of those children were placed into non-Indian settings. And we're not just looking at California, we're talking about on a national level, and in other states it's much higher. But in Cal California alone, uh, these were the statistics. Uh, even as recent as 2008, 2010, and 2012, um, after California established a Blue Ribbon Commission, they also identified higher percentages of Indian children in the system are currently being recognized in so much that we have a disproportionate number with Native American children and African American children currently in California. We top the charts in every single county. Yeah, because of the alarming um, figures and because the percentages have been so high. Um, These were also what Congress found with um, Indian children being placed in non-Indian foster homes. Um, of course, they're going to suffer serious adjustment problems. You know, they've been ripped from their homes. Why wouldn't they? Um, they also found um, some of the congressional findings that state courts, they failed to recognize what was essential to tribal relations of Indian people and cultural and social standards. Um, prevailing in Indian communities and families. Some of the additional congressional findings included that they needed to assemble a task force to address the high percentage of the Indian families broken up, as well as they found that there was no resource more vital to the continued existence and integrity of Indian tribes than their children. Um, as well as that the U.S. has the responsibility to protect Indian children who are members of or eligible for membership in an Indian tribe. Uh, and keep in mind, what we're talking about here is the Indian Child Welfare Act. This is all pre-Indian Child Welfare Act legislation. But as we get into the act's passage, which is, next slide please. Do you, um, I asked her when we were putting this together, I said, what was going on? How did this even get on the radar? I said, I won't, what was what was it like back then? You know, I don't know. <laughs> and she had mentioned that um, mm -hmm. her dad was helping and he was Help instrumental on, yeah. in helping um, getting the act passed. But what else was going on with Indian children? That's why I wanted to know. I said I need to know. Like all of a sudden, tribes just woke up and said, "Hey, we need to do something." I said, "No. What was you know what was it like back then?" Right. Um, and we're talking about the passage of the act in 1978. Prior to 1978, uh, in the late 50s, uh, we have termination era. Also in the 60s and leading into the 70s, we have a number of different enactments happening in, at the national level. We have a number of um, different policies being put forth. And Indian Child Welfare Act was one item that got addressed by, by the congressional um, committee that was um, set up as a task force to take a look at um, the forced removals, the death rates, um, the suicide rates, uh, the incidents of children being placed outside of their Indian communities. And they did that. They heard that after they assembled the task force, they held the hearings. Uh, they listened to hundreds and hundreds of testimonies from different people throughout the nation, tribal leaders, tribal parents. Um, talk about uh, missing children. These children were not only missing, they were removed, they were killed, they were slaughtered. Um, and that's really what the basis was for moving it forward, getting that task for design to hear these issues. Um, Layla mentioned that, you know, my dad was part of it. Of course, a lot of tribal leaders who 
um, now are probably 70s and 80s and also have passed on. A lot of our California Indian leaders were all part of these movements back in D.C., the National Indian Policy Review Commission, the Commission on Indian Aging, uh, Indian Education, Indian Preference. All of these things were happening during the Civil Rights Movement. And as a result of that, in the 78, this is, this is one of the acts that got passed. Um, you also will find that um, in 1978, as it was passed, you'll see the code section where it's found. You also find in the Federal Register um, is a section entitled the Bureau of Indian Affairs Guidelines for State Court Proceedings. Um, this is a section that is it's, it's used as a guide, um, and most of the state courts use them use them when they're referencing Indian Child Welfare Compliance. We recently had an update to the Bureau of Indian Affairs guidelines in February of 2015, uh, and that's the first of its kind in over 30 plus years. It, it's unheard of. Uh, the second thing I want to mention about that is the shortly after that in March, the regulation followed and we believe that that also set the tone for why we have these lawsuits forming um, not only did we have um, a halfway good decision out of the baby Veronica case, we also have um, the BIA guidelines coming out after that decision. We also have a, another huge major lawsuit that, was, that prevailed in North and South Dakota. Uh, and just briefly on that, um, you have tribes who entered into a, um, a class action suit with a number of Indian parents and they prevailed against those two states and all the justices. And they sued the judges, the county, state attorney, et cetera, et cetera. So we believe um, all that combined, that also is really, you know, set up the, uh, I guess, the, the hurdle, if you want to call it the legal hurdle with the opposition. Um, BIA guidelines have come out, they're brand new. Um, there hasn't been any training on it, and I believe that is something that uh, we will look forward to do um, in California and with the tribes. Um, we've looked at them, we've read them, and we've compared them with old ones. A lot of really good, solid information in it. Also in the CFR, um, that's where you'll see a lot of our information which, rec um, which references um, how we operate Indian child welfare and the process for handling these kids' cases. So. Under the Indian Child Welfare Act, we often refer to best interests. Best interests of an Indian child is much different than just um, a, a child in the system, in that it actually puts the language, the defin defined language, into the law. Uh, it was established to promote the best interests of Indian children, and the stability and the security of the Indian tribes and families are intertwined with the underlying premise being that it is in the best interest of an American Indian child that the role of the tribal community in the child's life be protected. This is something much more profound than just the parents having rights over their children. Our tribal children have an exclusive relationship with their tribe, and that's something that needs to be maintained throughout the life of the children. Even, even with or without the parents, the tribe acts as the Indian child's third parent. So if, if you can think of it in that concept, that's the reason why the tribes have a role in these types of proceedings. We act as the third parent, and we act as a non-offending party, even though the parents may have done you know, something, occurrence has happened, and we have charges against those parents. The tribe has never offended, and that's the kind of position I want you to go in thinking that you know, we're non-offensive, we have a right to be here, these are our children, give me my rights. You know, so this is what it's premised on because Congress determined that there's no better interest for that children than to maintain that strong relationship with its tribe. It also acknowledges the special relationship between the tribes, federal government, seeks to protect the essential tribal relations. Um, and these uh, relationships between tribes and federal government and their members, members are premised on more than cultural considerations. Indians are members of tribes, and they are not simply separate racial or cultural groups, but separate political groups. And of course, we have a case citation, Morton v. Mancary, I believe, if you've gone over any of that. That's the citation. It carries the same type of weight 
And uh, we cite that because that's the, that's the basis for the Indian Child Welfare Act. It's not race-based, it's, it's political. Um, I do want to add, though, too, um, in, no, that's fine. In, in my opinion, um, the Indian Child Welfare Act is possibly one of the most powerful pieces of legislation ever created for tribes and their, and their members, especially their children. And that's, you know, that's, I, I do want to say that because that's the basis from where we operate. Um, the Indian Child Welfare, because it is multifaceted and it is a powerful statute that includes provisions, um, most of those provisions um, also include the tribal rights and tribes' rights and opportunities. Uh, Indian social and cultural considerations are factored in. And what we're going to focus on today are the minimum federal standards for state court proceedings. This is merely the act, the law, and the process. Um, I heard a question over here earlier. The Indian Child Welfare Act is a, is, a, is a federal law created only for state courts. The Indian Child Welfare Act does not apply in tribal court. So tribes, we've seen tribes adopt a lot of the similar language and take it in and use a lot of the same information. But it is a, it's, a, it's a federal law created for the minimum standards that state courts are to follow with regard to the process of Indian children in a state court system. So just keep that in mind. Um, in addition to um, having the Indian Child Welfare Act alive and well and kicking, uh, in California, as late as 2007, the tribes felt the need to reinforce language. Um, so a number of tribes and, and ICWA advocates and proponents got together and um, created a bill, Senate Bill 678. Uh, it became effective in 2007. What, two seven, um, what 678 did is it amended, clarified, and expanded the role of the Indian Child Welfare Act in all juvenile proceedings in California. Um, the first part of it, amending the Family Probate, the Welfare and Institutions Code, it's, it's important because we know that there was a minimum application in the Welfare and Institutions Code proceedings. Those are your CPS, your adoption cases, very minimal applied. What, what 678 did is it said, no, you must do these things. And in addition to that, there were a number of other provisions that 678 added um, in addition to that, the clarification uh, for family law, probate, and certain delinquency proceedings, um, many of the courts and court officers, probation, they were not applying um, the Indian Child Welfare Act to any of those proceedings. Uh, we happen to know that in some of the probate proceedings involving a guardianship or a conservatorship, they were not following the law. So we said, impose it on them as well. So they took all four areas and imposed it on everyone. It also expands the protection for Indian families and tribes in a few key areas. One of those areas is that with the tribe that's non-federally recognized, the act only applies to federally recognized tribes. But Senate Bill 678 um, has a provision in it that says that if a child is a member or eligible for a member in a non-federal recognized tribe, um, they merely can appeal to the, uh, the court, the judge or the commissioner, and he can basically certify that, yes, we will follow the spirit of the Indian Child Welfare Act. So that child, that family also would have the ability to work with their non-federally recognized tribe, tribal leaders, program services, et cetera. So that's a benefit. Um, there also is some bypass provisions explained. We don't have it on the screen as well, but the bypass provision is something that says in the welfare and institutions process that if a parent has lost a child in a prior CPS case, they don't have an opportunity to ever have children in their custody if CPS becomes involved with the family. That's called a bypass. They're gonna fast track them through. We're not gonna give you any rights because we happen to know you lost your daughter last year. So what ICWA says and what Senate Bill uh, 678 says is that notwithstanding federal law, and we do know new current law with BIA guidelines, et cetera, et cetera, new stuff that's come out, 
you can't treat a case like that, especially Indian case. An Indian case has to be treated on a case-by-case -case basis. So it's brand new for my Indian mom over here that's lost three children. <laughs> You know, she gets another shot because this is a new child, new day, new age. And so, and, and what, what I would like to say about that is sure, there are some circumstances and times when there has to be a decision made with regard to a child not being with the family or the parent. But in most circumstances, in the, over the last 20 years that I've worked, the tribes have always held out hope for their people to heal and become well. And that's, you know, that's my personal opinion, that I hold out hope for them. You know, I'm, I'm not giving up on them. I want them to get well. You're getting your kids back. Now get it together, you know. That's, that's the kind of advocate I like to be for them. And I think that's what the bill also allows us to do, is to not give up hope on our people. And we put it in a tone and say we're not giving up on them. So that, I just wanted to add that because I like to throw good stuff in their wiki up every now and then. <laughs> So what we're going to do is we're going to go through uh, the law, and I want to go through um, the definition section because this is really helpful for people um, when you're asked in your positions whether or not ICWA applies and whether or not this is the case. What if a tribal member is a documented child molester and they get out and then have a new child? What if? Yeah, do they get the second chance if they're not going to do something that big? Well, it depends. I mean, if there's documentation and there are certain issues pertaining to a crime that's been committed, um, in my, and, and this is not my expertise area, but I happen to know in, in some of the circumstances that we've dealt with, um, usually it doesn't apply to their own children. The safeguards where a person has to register as a 290 doesn't apply to their own biological children. They can be in the home of their own biological children, no others. Unless the act specific, unless the act or specifically is related to a biological child, and then you'll have protection orders set up in that regard. So I answered a little bit. We got some examples of those too, believe me, in our case loads. So uh, the definition of an Indian parent is the biological parent or parents of an Indian child. Biological, remember that. Or any Indian person, any Indian person who has lawfully adopted an Indian child, including adoptions under tribal law or custom. And then it does not include the unwed father where paternity has not been acknowledged or established. That language is in yellow. That was the determining language out of the baby Veronica case. So we see exactly where it fits into our law, how it is defined. And I, and I want to tell you, um, we, have, we, we represent four tribes in our program. We probably have, I don't know, a couple hundred cases, maybe close to a couple hundred cases. 90% of our cases probably are with families that are not married. So, who does that apply to? Almost everybody in our caseload, right? The person does not also have to be Indian. So if you're looking at an Indian parent, they don't have to be Indian, but they meet the definition of Indian parent because they have an Indian child or an Indian baby, okay? So keep that in mind. So Layla pointed out that she wanted us to maybe hit on the definition and how it applies to the disenrollment of an Indian child. It's key. Um, and we know that's happening, that's, that's current, and it's, it's, it's all over the place. Um, I also want you to keep in mind, though, that Senate Bill 678 recognizes non-federally. So we have two pieces of law right now in California, both kind of working together, not certain how it's going to work. The federal definition and the way that the law works is that, yes, they will recognize the Indian Child Welfare Process for people who meet the definition the parents and the child. If the child's been removed um, and possibly disenrolled, the ICWA may not apply to that child. May not. Now, that doesn't mean that the child might be eligible in another tribe. So you, you have to look at all of, the, all of the details of whether or not that definition still could apply. So if the child's been removed, but the parent's still an enrolled member somewhere, the act still may apply. 
In my particular case, um, I'm eligible for five or six tribes. So, you know, my children, my children's children, they can take their pick. So those are the things that you need to take a look at. And it applies to the children um, and whether or not, you know, the tribe, um, if the tribe if the tribe is saying that because we have an issue with regard to um, whether the act applies or not, that's the tribe's decision. Um, we've we've gone to battle for a lot of tribes and a lot of folks and a lot of children, and sometimes you know it's it's um, things that we have to do with our tribal councils to really work out these issues of how do we continue to protect the children. We did have this happen where. Uh, family was disenrolled during the middle of one of our cases. Um, although the tribe um, no longer provided direction on what we were to do, the court still treated it as an Indian child welfare case and allowed us to close it out as such. So we still placed with a tribally approved home, um, with a tribal family, and that's just kind of how we worked the case until they closed it out in a guardianship, I believe. Yeah. May not always be the case, though, but in our instance, it worked Yeah, it worked and our, and our tribes were very supportive, like Layla said. They were very supportive that it was a process, a political process, but we did the best we could to handle it, and we still dealt with the children and the family in that regard. So just to clarify, um, the descendants of a disenrolled person may lose their protection under ICWA. In other words, they may not be considered an Indian child under the act. Correct. Because it's two-pronged. The child has to be the biological member of an enrolled tribal member. Biological child of an enrolled member. So right. um, there's a two-prong. So keep that in mind. If the parents are being removed. Now some tribes, and I can say this, some tribes are allowing children to enroll even though their parents are not enrolled. And we have multiple tribes like that. So it can work both ways. But yes, directly the lineal descendancy is being looked at because, um, you know, the definition have, have is we even thought of that? Yeah, question, Marilyn? Yeah, well, just to comment more, it's the eligible for membership in a tribe, which is so critical. And a lot of people are not, the children are not eligible for a membership. And I think it really needs, I mean, they are eligible for membership, but they're not enrolled. And I think that needs to be um, addressed also. Right, right. And I think you're right, the eligibility part of it, um, we really need, need to take a look at that because what we're talking about is minor children here. We're talking about children that are, don't have the, the privilege or the benefit to speak for themselves, right? Mm -hmm. So we as adults, people that are working within our systems, with our tribes, our governments, in our programs, it was set up to design to protect that interest. And so we keep that in mind as we're going through this because that child may have an interest not just in this tribe but possibly another. And, and it needs to be inherently protected with regard to that. Right. Um, question there? In regard to uh, enrollment ordinances, so the standards are uh, set based on each uh, respective tribe's enrollment ordinance as well. Yeah, correct. And, and what we're saying is we're not advising or recommending that you not take a look at the tribe's constitution, its articles, its enrollment, ordinance, anything like that. We have to consider all that. We operate under all applicable law. However, there can be exceptions, and we have work, and we do work for tribes that have sections that have been amended into their constitutions or articles or their bylaws which govern enrollment or eligibility and they do specify in, in cases of Indian children in, in the, involved in Indian Child Welfare Act and that's how they you know really taken a look at that it's a we, real good yeah. flip on things we do things. have tribes still intervening even though the children have um, not been enrolled whether they missed the enrollment period for that year or they didn't you know have all their documents in time but they still do intervene you have a question? If, um, because according to, according to placement standards, we have to have a resolution that states that the child is uh, a member from a federally recognized tribe. In the resolution, that's what it says. So I asked if it was that's acceptable. your guys' tribe. Yeah, in our tribe. In our tribe. So I asked if it was acceptable to 
st make a stipulation in the resolution stating that the minor child is eligible for enrollment and therefore being tribally placed. Mm -hmm. Right, because the tribe, like this slide says, you are the, um, you're making the decision for your own yeah. members. So you can word it however you want and you know that the child's eligible, so. And according to equal law, then it'll still make the child qualify. A absolutely, because, because it's, it's eligibility. It's not, it's not based on enrolled yeah. or members, it's based on eligibility. And with, as long as a, the parent is, because mm -hmm. in cases we have mm -hmm. some where one child, the parent has five kids and one child's not enrolled with us. Or but we know they that. miss the window, yeah. exactly yeah. like you'd yeah. said. Yeah. Yeah. But we know mom is enrolled mm -hmm. and there's no yeah, and those those examples, it's it's not ever argued. We just go along as if it applies because it does apply under the federal law. Yeah, and the and tribe's getting it, you know, their action together. But it would still be considered as like a tribal home. Yes, because of the parent, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yes, and and it's a good example because we have a lot of newborns. You know, I don't know about anybody in the room, but I don't believe you automatically have a roll number when you're released from the hospital, you know? <laughs> At least I haven't found too many. But, you know, you have to think about that. That baby is eligible somewhere if their parents are Indian, possibly, right? And we want to do everything possible to protect that little teeny tiny person there. And that's that inherent responsibility in all of us to look at the definition, the federal definition, in case we have a court case on that. Or if we don't have a court case on it, what do we do as, as tribes, tribal governments, and, and advocates to take a look at protecting that child's inherent sovereign right, right? Not just you know in the courtroom, but in the tribe. Next, Next slide. Okay, so we always get off. And so the Indian custodian um, is another defined term. It's any Indian person who has legal custody of an Indian, Indian child, and we all know an Indian custodian. It's done by tribal law or custom. Uh, it is, uh, through state law, it can also be recognized as a guardianship or an adoption, or whenever there's temporary physical care or custody and control, it's been transferred um, by the parent to somebody and that person has to be Indian. Indian custodians also have the same rights as Indian parents under the law. So um, if that child is removed from the Indian custodian, you need to notify them and all the same rights apply to that Indian custodian. Uh, very often what we've seen in our caseloads is that we get a phone call, um, child's been removed you know, from my sister, the CPS just came over and took her, and. That's an invalid removal, and you know it's against an Indian custodian. Possibly that person also has the same rights as the Indian parents. Do you have a question over there? Yeah, um, there was a, a case um, that I'm aware of where the the children were taken from the mother's home um, into the care of CPS. One of the children was a tribal member. The um, tribe intervened, stepped in. Um, and tried to apply their their equal rights. The county, however, that it was in was it was it was like a long um, case that we had. It was like three years mm -hmm. because the siblings were non-native and they were in a foster home and they used the the excuse that the children should be and stay together. Mm -hmm. um, but the child, uh, the native child, he had actually we had had him already for a while. And so I just wonder, um, when, the, when the county courts are cooperating with the equal law, what do you do? You know, is there a way to speed up the process? Because that was a lot of money for that case. I mean, we, we came up in the end on top, but it took a long time. Right. That's not an unusual or rare case. I'd like to, you know, say that that first and foremost, that happens quite often because we have a lot of Indian children who have siblings who are, don't have the same father or mother. Um, but we, we definitely want to take a look at how it works with state law. So in your particular situation, um, they use the term um, to, uh, it's in the best interest of the children for the sibling group to stay together. And that's a, that's a standard. We also like to take a look at that. Is it beneficial to the child or more beneficial to the folks that have the children? Um, and the tribe can come in with their opinion on it. It's not something that's gonna directly drive the um, decision, 
but you really can weigh in on that. And in a lot of cases, what we've seen in our, in our area is that we have the Indian child placed separately with a really strict sound visitation and contact arrangement between the sibling groups. We've also seen that where we've placed an Indian child, the non-Indian children have come, also been placed with Indian folks, non-related, and we've seen that happen as well. So it works both ways, but it's, it's something that, I guess it depends on the county too and how well they're able to work with the tribe. But those are you know, cases where we would, we would love to see it work out that way so that the kids have one another. It's hard enough for them being in the system. Yeah, it was real frustrating because the tribe made every effort to make sure that the siblings were in contact, you know, um, transporting, paying for them to come and stay the night on the, you know, at our mm -hmm. hotel, all those things. And it seemed like the judge just was still hesitant to go ahead with the process of the guardianship and things like that for the Indian child. Right, and you know, sometimes that's what it takes is the education to the judge because we have, unfortunately, we in our counties, we have social workers and some people who have worked there for so many years that they're used to doing it the old school, and that's what we meet up with is that resistance. We've got new law, new things happening in California, and so we wanna try to get you know, before them and say, these are the things that we're working on together. It's, it's a better collaborative effort these days, and you know, whatever we can do to change that uh, mentality, Sometimes we have to go directly to the directors to do that. Uh, what, what county was the case in, if I can ask? Butte County. Butte County, yep, notorious. But, yeah, and I heard but, a lot about them. Oh, too. yeah, I had a case there. But, um, but yeah, you're right. But I do know that the tribes in that area, um, I've worked with a lot of tribes in that area, they have an in, a Indian Child Welfare Roundtable, and we'll talk about that at the end of the presentation on how you get to work with some of the uh, directors and leadership in that county so that your tribes can directly influence the outcome on your cases better. Oh, great, thank you. Um, uh, under the Indian custodian, there are a couple different um, bullets that we didn't hit. Um, it can be done in writing, it can be done orally, or it's just assumed one day, you know, mom didn't come back, right? <laughs> And my grandson's been with me for about three years now, right? So I'm an Indian custodian, right? So the other thing is, um, because it's voluntary, it can be revoked at any time. Um, just, and we see that happen quite a bit. And just remember, this is one of your tools, though, too, that you can use, um, depending on the timing. You know, if you know that you have a relative who may be in a at risk situation, if you have the opportunity to speak with them and say, hey, is it okay if so-and-so, make sure it's an Indian person, um, can take care of your child until you get things, you know, together or until you're well enough to take care of yourself and your, your, your child or your children, um, it is a tool that, you know, it can possibly prevent CPS involvement. So remember that it's there, but again, it's also can be revoked at any time. That may be CPS's hesitancy, but that's also where the family support needs to come in as well as the tribe supporting that family and that um, Indian custodian knowing uh, that they have to safeguard that child as well. So remember though, it is a tool for you to use. Do you have a question? Like you were just saying, I was wondering if the said custodian needs to go through um, all the home checks and all the things that they need to do in order to become a uh, uh, Indian foster home. Um, I was at one point going to take um, a relative's two children and Butte County. Butte County over there. And <laughs> um, they, ha they basically intervened and they, he said he wanted to give them to a Native American relative and they wanted me to go through all the stuff and the children were going to go someplace else in the meantime. Mm -hmm. But they said that I had to have my house ready, checked, all that stuff before the children came. Um, that's kind of a two-prong scenario, but Indian custodians are done voluntarily. Doesn't In, involve, instantly. Too. Doesn't involve there's, there's no any third that. party whatsoever. Um, you know, I'm going to jail this weekend, and my children need somewhere to go. I'm going to give them to my cousin or my uncle or my sister, right? That's the new Indian custodian. CPS can't come in and remove my children because I've taken the necessary steps to 
protect them in my absence. Unless there's an at Unless situation with that Indian custodian, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. Um, but again, it comes back to how hard do you want to fight that? Because you can, because the tribe could have said, hey, we're tribally approving this home. There's no need for those children to go to another home in the meantime and have them move right. again. Right. And, and that's the other part of your um, question is that tribes can tribally approve their own homes. You don't have to be state licensed or approved. In fact, we'll, we'll touch on that at the end of the, end of the um, presentation. There's new legislation. Um, 1460, we'll hit that pretty soon. Let's try to well, keep Another moving. question, and then we'll keep moving. Go ahead. Go Sorry, ahead. I'll try to make it short. Um, I just had an incident happen. It was a few years ago. Uh huh. But um, we, my, can we keep it down for a sec so we can hear the question? My sister's kids, they were in a home, and something happened, and she took the kids to the hospital. They found that drugs were in their system. Mm -hmm. She was afraid CPS was gonna take them, so she told me to take them home with me. Well, later on that night, um, sheriffs and CPS came. I didn't know what to do, and they told me I had to surrender the kids or I was going to jail. So mm -hmm. was that right, or did I have more rights? Well, it depends on a lot more circumstances than we just heard, <laughs> because uh, the Indian Child Welfare Act has a process for removals, and we'll get into the active efforts. But like, it that happened have to that fast. Like they yeah, went to the because, hospital, I took them home, and right. then I didn't know what right, else to do. Right, because what it what it involves is imminent danger, imminent risk. So if there's an immediate issue at hand, emergency like that, that's an emergency. That's an imminent issue. Law enforcement can come in any time. They don't even have to have cause if they think that the child is in, you know there's a threat on the child and that instance a safety health and safety issue it they doesn't don't, mean they couldn't have gone with you after. right and, and, and then child, the children could still come back right. but because of that issue and the hospital being mandated reporters that's an emergency issue and that's why it kicks in so quickly because i did what they said and then my aunt was saying that i shouldn't have you know and i i don't know all the details of it but you know, I'll lay down in front of the truck too, but you know, <laughs> I'm going, I'm hanging on to this. But, but you know, sometimes, you know, we got to figure out what we can do to preserve us as being a good placement too. I don't want to jeopardize me being a good placement. So I will comply. I will work with yeah, you. I'll right. do whatever you say, you know, I'll jump through hoops, whatever it is. But you know, you want to get all the facts and details and get the tribe to back it as well. Yeah, because it was me and a bunch of kids. Uh, and yeah, they came swarming. They had the guns ready at the door and everything. And I just opened the door. This and is confidential. Like, <laughs> 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 but again, this is stuff too that we don't, we don't really get into the details of any one particular case. But you know, it's highly confidential work that we do. And we just want to be mindful and respectful of you and your family too. That It didn't even go into okay. a case. Oh, okay, that's good. That's what was weird. Good, good. That's good. Um, where we an Indian custodian, the Indian tribe. This is how the um, ICWA defines Indian tribe. Indian tribe, any tribe, band, nation, or other organized group of community Indians recognized and eligible for services and provisions through the Secretary of Interior because of their status as Indians. It also includes Alaska Natives. It's defined in Section 1602, Title 43. There is also a list that's, that's published in the Federal Register annually. Uh, we do have a link to the... Do we have a link to that? It's on our flash. Oh, we have it on our flash, so we'll, we'll show it to you a little bit later. But the Federal Register lists all federally recognized tribes. They also list the federally recognized tribes Indian Child Welfare Contact. And um, in that, you'll, you'll be notified as a tribal government of who you want to do your Indian Child Welfare work. When you fill out that form, that's what goes into the Federal Register. So sometimes tribes just put the chair people or the council when really you have an advocate or you have a, maybe a department head. You can, you can do whatever you want on that, but that's what goes into the Federal Register, and that's who CPS notifies they have to pull from the Federal Register. So if you see that and you want to make certain you designate the proper person, uh, take a look at that because um, now they're being updated more often. It used to be they were updated every 10 years. Now, now it seems like they're updated every year, which is great because there's a big turnover all the time. Um, Senate Bill 678 also allows for participation for non-federally recognized tribes. So, so I just want to I want to emphasize that is that if you are uh, from a non-federally recognized tribe. You know, don't let anyone tell you that ICWA doesn't apply to your children in California because it does. It 
could. <laughs> yeah, and we, and we definitely fight for that, yes. Um, tribal membership, tribe's determination, membership or eligibility is conclusive. We went over this. In the absence of tribal determination, the Bureau of Indian Affairs will determine for you. So if you are not determining eligibility or membership on these the cases, on the notices that come out, the Bureau of Indian Affairs will respond for you. And we're like, oh, we don't want them involved at all. But it ha it's, part of the, it's part of the provision. Uh, absent tribal or BIA determination, the court will determine whether ICWA applies. Because we know BIA sometimes fails to, you know, comply respond or respond. Respond to those thousands of notices that go out. Thousands we, and thousands. Uh, a couple years ago, we did a, a class or a presentation, and BIA said they received something like 22,000 notices a year. And they're in one central office in Albuquerque. Yeah. So you can imagine and that's just for this how region. efficient that must be. <laughs> what did they know about all of our small bands and tribes? They don't know anything. So it's criti critical for the tribes to make their determination and also to set out a process to make certain someone can take a look at how we're responding to these notices. I'd like to just make a small comment on sure. that because I totally agree with you 100%, but it also costs a lot of money. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thousands and thousands of dollars um, out of the budget, out of the tribal budget, to pay CILS to represent these children. It's very costly. Yep. And CILS is doing your equal work for you? Okay. Yeah. We would charge pretty good too. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Well, all the more, all the more reason why it's important to train other staff members, or you uh -huh. know, learn what's going on yourself mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. It is it, well, the benefit of having CILS is that they're law trained. Layla and I are not attorneys, but we know the law because we've been practicing for quite a bit. But we're we're not received in the same way as an attorney would be received. In a court proceeding. In a court proceeding, and we can talk about that in the practicality part of it because those are some of our struggles going into the courtroom or representing be, on behalf of tribes. Um, tribal uh, child custody proceedings, and these are some of the proceedings that are covered: foster care placements. Are we still in definitions? Why is on this one? Yeah. Uh, the, under the definition section for foster care placement, it means any action removing an Indian child from its parent or an Indian custodian for temporary placement into a foster home or institution or the home of a guardian or conservator where the parent or Indian custodian cannot have the child returned upon demand but where parental rights have not been terminated. It's a huge, long sentence, and what does it really mean, right? Um, that, that's what triggers the initial proceeding. And this is what we're talking about is with CPS, sometimes in delinquency, you'll see this as well. Um, under child custody proceedings, the two types of proceedings as well. Termination of parental rights proceedings, which shall mean any action resulting in the termination of parental child relationship. Uh, the other action is pre-adoptive placement, which shall mean the temporary placement of an Indian child in a foster home or institution after the termination of parental rights, but prior to or in lieu of an adoptive placement. These are all processes that happen every single day when we have an Indian child welfare proceeding. When you get to the end of the case, this is what happens. Okay. Well, that's a, a process. Child custody proceedings, the adoptive placement, which shall mean the permanent placement of an Indian child for adoption, including any action resulting in a final decree of adoption. It does not include a placement based upon an act which, if committed by an adult, would be deemed a crime or upon an award in a divorce proceeding of custody to one of the parents, and that's delinquency in family law. So these are the two types of proceedings ICWA does not apply. Doesn't apply in the action of a delinquency action where a juvenile, if they were to commit an act, if it were committed by an adult, would it be a crime? That's how you, you look at that. The other one is in divorce proceedings. ICWA does not apply, and we know that gets confused quite a bit, right? All the time. 
Um, those, those are the two specifics that we want to say it doesn't, it doesn't apply to, but we'll get to a little bit more detail uh, in the practice part of that. In our California ju juvenile dependency system, which is what we're talking about for those minimum federal standards, this is the CPS system. <clears throat> uh, it applies to tribal children and families, whether on or off the reservation. Three critical hearings that we want to talk about. The detention hearing, which is done within 48 hours after the child's removed. The jurisdictional hearing, that's the hearing where the court comes in, takes jurisdiction over the child. And then the dispositional hearing is done to determine placement. Will the child go home or will the child go into a system and be placed? We have review hearings held every six months. Unless it's on children under the age of three, then they're done every 90 days. Um, family reunification or family maintenance are two types of um, processes that can be selected if your case has gone into a dependency case. Uh, we also do concurrent planning. Uh, when we are meeting with Child Protective Services, we have the ability to create a concurrent plan. We also would focus on the permanent plan which means if, in fact, um, Indian custodian or Indian parents are at the verge of losing their children, there are three goals, long-term foster care, guardianship, or adoption. And recently, there's been a new um, category entitled tribal customary adoption. So there's four options now. So when you get to the permanent plan, we need to select what do we want for this, these children. So you have to be mindful all throughout the whole process. If this case doesn't go back and it, it doesn't have a good result and they're not going back to the parents or Indian custodian, if, if that's what the tribe determines, um, then we have to look at a permanent plan. Uh, termination of parental rights proceedings. Um, oh, these are awful, so I don't, you know, it's, it, I, you can tell I don't, I'm not favoring the termination of parental rights proceedings, but these are things that happen pre-adoptive and when your adoptions occur. If we're doing a tribal customary adoption, no, temp, no termination of parental rights proceedings take place. Okay, so th there's a difference there. Sure. Uh, in the tribal customary adoption, which is a new option for permanency, um, your parental rights are not terminated. The Indian parents' rights are not terminated. It's just as good as a conventional adoption. If not, it's even better. Because what it allows, is it allows the tribe to create the order. Who they're going to place with, how much contact, what the family has to be responsible to fulfill for those children. It's direct tribal order adopted in state court. The, her question was, in, in case there was uh, a chance for the parents to heal and recover, there's some potential for contact. It's specifically set out to have contact between the child and its extended relatives community, although there is no provision in there that allows for an overturn of the adoption. It's final. But yeah. Yes, contact is addressed Contacts, in the order. Visitation, contact, all of that's in there. Mm-hmm. Uh, inquiry, is the, Indi is the child an Indian child? If there's reason to believe that the child is Indian, the court, the county, and the department, probation, all have the responsibility. So it's any party seeking the removal or uh, termination of parental rights. They have an affirmative and ongoing continuing duty to make further inquiry to determine uh, whether or not uh, the child is Indian. And they have to do that as soon as possible. <clears throat> Rule. Uh, 5.481, these are out of the Rules of Court and Welfare and Institutions Code. Our social workers have to have and they have to perform uh, reasons to know if somebody says something to them, if they're just given an inkling, and here's some examples. Uh, persons with an interest in a child, including an Indian tribe, an Indian organization, officer of the court, public or private agency, or any member of the child's extended family provides information. If anybody says anything, that's reason to know. These are all grounds for appeal, and we've seen all types of cases where it's been known and they failed to follow the act. Um, residents, does the child reside in a predominantly Indian community? 
you know, we kind of know in Indian country, we, we know our communities, and a lot of times so do our law enforcement people. <laughs> so they can't really say, oh, we didn't know. Um, child or family has received services from an Indian health, tribal TANF, other Indian agencies or programs, which pretty much are exclusive to tribal services. Do you have a question? I was just going back to like, okay. if, 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 if they didn't follow the law, could it be grounds to dismiss the case? Is that what you said? Or Yes, it, it very well could be. What it does is it sets up a basis for appeal. So if they violate any portion of the Indian Child Welfare Act, and this could be one of them, that they didn't treat the case as an Indian case because they didn't ask. Well, if you have reason to know, and these are reasons to know, right, that it's on you, you're the removing party, we're coming after you, and we're going to take you on appeal, and we're going to win. Because these are all violations of the law. Okay, so it could very well happen that way. A uh, social worker should make uh, status of the inquiry, uh, make it clear in the petition, the notice, and the reports. I, I skimmed over the forms, the 010, 020, and the 030. These are essential um, judicial counsel forms that come into our tribal offices, um, and we see these all the time. They must be filled out accurately, and 99% of the time they're not. <laughs> so we're always doing research. That's, that's one of Layla's main jobs there is to look at the reports and see whether or not it's one of our children. Sometimes we have real good information. Other times we don't have any information, so she's doing a ton of research on it. And we, you know, we think that's also probably happening in a lot of your tribes as well. So we, you know, we go after some of the legal department people um, when, when there's issues on some of the cases. Um, this is an ongoing process. This, this just doesn't happen at the very beginning of the case, and it just doesn't happen um, leading into it. It's ongoing throughout the life of it. So as they learn more and more information about the child and the family, they have to act. Uh, with regard to notice, this is an official term, notice. Parents, legal guardians, Indian custodians, tribes, and the Bureau of Indian Affairs must be notified of pending petitions. Proof of notice includes copies of notice sent, to the re sent and responses received. They must be filed with the court. So when you guys get uh, the cards, registered certified mail, and you sign for it, that is the little card that goes in the court record, and it has to be signed and received and dated. If it's not, you guys weren't served. And those are all grounds for appeal, but, you know, there's not much training and education on that when, you know, the courts and officers, social workers are standing with you. They don't tell you that because that's their responsibility. So those are all things that we want to make clear that when you set up your programs, you know, have a mechanism to um, keep that intact. Whenever a notice is sent, it must be sent to all tribes to which the child may be a member or may be eligible for membership. And in my situation, you can send it to five tribes. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, tribal notice should be sent to the tribal chairperson unless another agent for service has been designated, and that's in that federal register, and that's in that form. Whoever you designate, that's who those notices are going to. So if your chairperson's getting overwhelmed with these certifications and these, these notices, they can designate someone else, <laughs> you know, so that you can get a, a really quick response. But I do know, as a tribal chairperson, I used to still do Indian child welfare work, and, and I was a tribal chairperson half time, so I was like, you know, back and forth, but I eventually got someone to handle that part of it because it's so overwhelming. Um, the ICWA 030, which includes the uh, family tree, that's really essential because we want to know. We don't know a lot of our minor children, but we know their parents or we know their grandparents or their great-grandparents. If they're not listed on that family tree, we can't do a proper research. So whenever there's information left off of that 030, we need to call that county back and say, I need more info on this, otherwise I can't confirm, verify, or deny anything. Okay, um, tribal jurisdiction, we had a question about that earlier. Um, tribes have exclusive jurisdiction over children residing or domiciled on the reservation, except in temporary emergency removals. And because we're in a PL-280 state, we all know that there's concurrent jurisdiction. 
where such jurisdiction is otherwise vested in the state of by existing federal law, just said PL 280, concurrent jurisdiction over on-reservation children when not exclusive. So we do know a couple tribes have um, established exclusive jurisdiction in some of the tribes up north. And we had a case um, in Lake County for one of the Lake County tribes uh, that also claimed exclusive jurisdiction on the case. That went on appeal, and that was not decided, but you know, it was something that I think, um, it fell a little short of all of the facts in it, but it didn't really take away the ability to also work towards exclusive jurisdiction. I know. Um, <laughs> this is a, a quick slide, transferring jurisdiction to tribal court. Um, these are reasons why um, good cause transfer jurisdiction may not apply. And you'll see there's a ton of it. Um, good cause, objection, tribal court declines, tribe doesn't have the administrative body. And we're also talking about finances to provide services for those children. It creates a hardship, an undo on all parties. Um, and if it's late in the game, family reunification is over. What's the unreasonableness in the delay? If the child over 12 objects, it doesn't go. And um, parents of a child over five are unavailable and children has little or no contact with the tribe. Their socioeconomic conditions um, and perceived adequacy of tribal social services and judicial systems, those are not good causes and the court cannot consider those issues. Um, we had one question about a tribe being able to create its own authority under a resolution. This is where you would do that. A tribal council can establish that through tribal resolution, that's your tribal law. Transfers must be de denied in writing. And one other thing, um, I wanna stress that if any parent objects, it doesn't go to tribal court. ICWA and tribal jurisdiction. A tribe may reassume exclusive jurisdiction over child custody proceedings in all tribal acts, judicial proceedings, judgments, and records. And this is for my friend over here from Big Valley. Tribal acts, tribal judicial proceedings, judgments, and records are entitled to full faith and credit under the Indian Child Welfare Act. That's the section that you cite in your resolutions if you would like your resolutions treated as tribal law or tribal authority, okay? All right. I think one of the greatest benefits a tribal court can have is reassuming jurisdiction over ICWA cases. So could you uh, maybe speak just a little bit about that, how the difference, maybe the advantages for, to handling that in tribal court. Sure, Layla said don't do this. I'm just kidding. No, no, actually I think it's a, it's a direct benefit and I believe it's the true um, power and authority of the tribe really, really flexing its inherent muscles, you know, that this is what you're designed and set up to do is to self-govern and what better place to do that in your own forum? Even if it, you know, it's something you know, as an Indian child welfare matter, I mean, it could be set up for all different other issues, right. but primarily children's cases that should be handled in our own forum. But unfortunately, we don't have very many of those established directly for that. And there's, there's a lack of resources and a number of other reasons why. Okay, with that, we are gonna take a quick five minute break. <laughs> 